eternal God, we are so grateful that you sit high, yet you look low. That your ear is not dull, that it cannot hear, nor your hand short, that it cannot say. And I ask that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Make us look to thee, O oh Lord. Yes, the CDC has information. Yes, the Justice Department has information. The World Health Organization has information. The, the Presidential Coronavirus Task Force has information. The Governor's Task Force has information. But the B-I-B-L-E <laughs> has information. <laughs> Lord, if we would just look to your word, we can be encouraged. If we just open your word, we see that we're pestilence and, and, and all kinds of diseases. That This is a new. But you are the same. coronavirus that we read about the miracles that are written in the book of Mark. We dare not forget how you opened blinded eyes, how you raised a little girl from the dead, how, Father, you raised Lazarus from the dead, how you healed blind part of man, how you gave the dumb, Lord God, the ability to speak. You opened deaf ears, Lord, your healing power has not stopped. May we, may we look to you for healing. Lord, healing through your word, through the understanding and power of your word, through the power of salvation. May we lean and depend on the Holy Spirit to bring scripture to our remembrance. That we may glorify you and honor you in all that we do. Now bless our preparation. Hide us behind the cross of Calvary. These were your people would see none of us but all of you, that they would hear none of us, Lord God, but they would hear you. Let us lay our agenda aside, pick up yours. For we are vulnerable, we are frail, we are weak, and there's nothing that we can do, but you can do magnificent things through us. Now may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is my prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 23, verse 26. Luke chapter 23 and verse 26. Luke chapter 23 and verse 26. I've been reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. It's just one verse. There is not even a whole lot of exegetical commentary regarding this text. It is found in all of the synoptics and made reference to slightly in John. The word of the Lord reads thusly. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Serene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. It's just one verse. I'm going to read it again. Just one verse. As they led Jesus away, Luke chapter 23, verse 26, a man named Simon, who was from Serena, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him 
And they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Would you bow your heads for a short word of prayer? Eternal God, our Father, may this message make us better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to take for a thought uh, this morning, I'd like to take for a thought the cross on my back. The cross on my back. The cross on my back. As I search for different media to go with this sermon, I notice that more tattoo references to this image were there than anything else. And there were people that had all kinds of elaborate tattoos of crosses on their back. And they were some very nice ones. However, I wonder what's going on in front if a tattoo of a cross is on your back. What's going on in front? Because what was going on in front of Simon of Serene was Jesus walking to Calvary's hill. Simon of Serene is not much in the Bible said about him. I had to find some historical information and piece together some things from all of the recordings of the gospel. And here they are, five things that I think you need to know about Simon. Five things you need to know about Simon of Serene. They are recorded nine Israelites who are named Simon. They, they, there's, there's a lot to be said about, about this man Simon, but no, we're not talking about those Simons. They're, they're the word, the, the name Simon occurs in the Bible about 75 times. But I want to make sure we understand we're talking about Simon of Serene. Number one, Simon was a Hellenistic Jew from Serene in the region of North Africa. Simon, Simon was a Hellenistic Jew from the Serene, from Serene in the region of North Africa. In other words, Simon then probably was a black man. Simon was a black man. He was a Hellenistic Jew. In other words, he was not of, uh, he was not born in Jerusalem. He was converted to Judaism, whether he had been practicing something else before or not. He was a Jew, a Hellenistic Jew. Number two, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus, who were early church Christians. They were early believers. The Bible records, maybe in Romans chapter 15, that this may be the same roof that Paul referenced in Romans chapter 15. That he, these sons of his, Mark records that he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Alexander and Rufus were known to have worship at the synagogue of freedom which is referenced to in Acts chapter 6. Number three, Simon was traveling from the countryside when life changed forever. Has life ever changed forever? Has, has life happened? You, 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 were, you, 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 you tell the story like this. I was driving down the road and my life was never the same. I went to the doctor's appointment and my life was never the same. I came from the emergency room and my life has never been the same. I woke up with a tingling in my hand and my life has never been the same. Simon was coming from the countryside. And his life was never the same. His life was changed forever. Number four, Simon was instructed and I use that word because I want to place some more emphasis on it a little later. But I use the word instructed because it was a little more violent than that. The Simon was instructed to carry the cross of Christ. 
he was instructed, time and did something that probably we take it for granted over the last some odd years of our reading of God's word and understanding the resurrection story. There's a lot of power in that statement. But he carried the cross of Christ. Number five, this one we should never forget. <clears throat> a great deed, a great deed that Simon did. But here it is. Christ died for Simon too. His work was insufficient to save himself. Christ died for Simon too. Though he did what may seem to be the most noble act of service, Christ died for him too. Because his noble work was insufficient to save himself. Some of us think that we're going to get in because we fed the hunger. We made donations to cancer research. We, we've done all of these good deeds. But if you do not accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, his payment and penalty for your sins, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bottom line. It's not by works that any man should boast. We have come this place in life because of the great and mercy of God and it behooves anyone to understand that there is no righteousness in your life. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And here it is, the most noble work that we see Simon do, yet it is insufficient to save himself. It's insufficient. The cross on my back the cross on my back. The cross on my back, whether we understand it or not, Simon has, they have laid hold of Simon. They have, they have put the cross of Christ on Simon's back and he's carrying it. And what we don't understand is that the cross that's on his back is burdened with the sins of mankind. The cross that is on his back is not his own cross, but it's Christ's cross. The cross that's on his back is stained with the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross that is on his back, and not only that, is wet from the sweat of Jesus having been whipped and flawed and beat and ridiculed. It's, it's heavy. It's a heavy cross. It's a heavy cross. How, how does this how does this narrative take place? How does it start? Now, I've tried to literate them in F's. If you'll just bear with me for about 15 minutes, we'll be done with it. The first one is, is they found him. They found him. The Bible said that he was coming in from the countryside when they found him. They had been coming out of Pontius Pilate's judgment seat and they stumbled up on Simon. And I thought about it like this. He was at the right place at the wrong time. Here's how I know it's the right place because most theologians believe that Simon was coming into town to celebrate the Passover. That he could have possibly been on a Passover pilgrimage when he ran upon an angry mob. And I begin to imagine in my mind, some of us, you know, you've been there before, right? You say you were just minding your business and all of a sudden. And I can imagine he was, he bent the corner, <coughs> and when he tried to go back the other way, they said, hey, hey, come here. And that's the way it is in our body. That's the way it is. Hey, come here. He was minding his own business. He probably had his back. We mind our own business. We all have a purpose. 
purpose in this life. And I want us to understand that sometimes we mind our own business and in doing so we neglect to help somebody else along the way. And because sometimes we say that's, that's their business. That's his business. That's her business. And I'm going to mind my own business. Somebody asked me one time, they said, well, I saw you and you never looked up. I said, no, that's, I was minding my own business. I try to make it a habit of minding my own business when I'm out in public. Because when you don't mind your own business, you'll find yourself in the same position that Simon was in. He was given a task that was not a pleasant task. He was given a task that was not a pleasing task. But we all have a purpose in this life, and we never know what it's going to be until we come face to face with one of life's greatest challenges, something that we probably could have ever imagined in our lives, but we grow out of that circumstance because what we understand is that God will not put us in a place that he cannot keep us. You know about the purpose of God, don't you? For we know that all things work together for good to them who are the call according to his purpose. We have to understand it's going to work out. No matter how bad it seems, no matter how dark and dismal it is, it's going to work out in God's perfect plan. He didn't know it, but they found him. Some of us, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. He was lost, and he knew where he was going. <laughs> but he was lost until he met the Savior. He didn't meet him like we met him. He met him, hung over, bed, body bowed, with a cross on his back. Well, he met Jesus, not with arms stretched out wide and begging him in to come in. But he met him outside Pilate's judgment hall. Not only did they find him, but they forced him. The Roman soldiers, the Bible says in one instance, said they pressed him to carry the cross of Jesus. They pressed him. One version says they compelled him. They pressed him. They forced him to carry the cross. Well, when they forced him to carry the cross, he complied. Now this, I, I thought about this, I thought about this. You do know that he could have refused to carry the cross, but there would have been some consequences, right? Mm -hmm. And when we, when we refuse to carry the cross, there's some consequences. We don't always know what those consequences are, so he decided not to find out. But this is what I want us to know. The difference between the Roman soldiers and God is this is that God doesn't force anyone to do anything. For a long time, I told him I wasn't singing the song, I Surrender All, because God doesn't arrest us and, and, and make us give up anything. God makes us free moral agents, and he desires that we make a choice to, to swap the old life that we live for a new life in him. And so we, he, doesn't, he doesn't force us. God doesn't pull a gun out. In the midst of our mess, we make a constant decision well, that my father has higher hands all right. for eating better than I am right now. Now you can choose to stay out there in the hog pen if you want to. God is a stand out. Not only will God be there to meet you, the Bible says he'll outstep every one of his traditions and he'll run out to meet you. Well, he'll run out to meet you. He'll enforce you, but all you have to do is turn around and go back home. God will be there. If you refuse, Jesus said it like this to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. He said it like this in the New Living Translation. If you refuse to take up your cross 
and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it, but if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. If you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give it up, you'll find it. There are some of us, I tell you what, we cling on to everything. We, we hard life. We hard it. And, and, and if all you get is what you got right here, then that's enough. Because at one day, it's going to all burn up. But if you Give up your life. He'll give you life eternal. Some of us have to make the decision. They found him. They forced him. And not only did they force him, they forgot him. After we find out that he carried the cross, we no longer hear anything else about Simon whatsoever. Yeah. Now some of us, we gladly carry the cross if they don't etch our name in the wall of cross bearers. <laughs> some of us will gladly raise our hand to carry the cross if they gonna give us a grant, if they gonna give us an Academy Award for Best Cross Carrier 2020. We raise our hands to carry the cross if they're going to put our name in the Atlanta Journal Constitution and we can get a million likes and we can go viral on YouTube. We gladly raise our hand to carry the cross, but after they use him to carry Christ's cross, they forgot. Got all about. The Christian cross. It's more like Christ's cross than it is Simon's cross. Because when you carry Christ's cross, God writes your name in the letter of the life. All right. <laughs> and then your name, you know, you may not get a grant. No, you, you, you may not, you may not have your name wrote, they may not do an article in the Atlanta Journal Constitution, but your name will be written in the letter of the life. So when you have Christ's cross, not Simon's cross, you never forgot. And here's what I understand. And this, this was made so real this morning on our Sunday school call. It was made real. Almost brought me to tears. And that is suffering, sacrifice, persecution, and, and, and everything about the cross of Christ can be downright uncomfortable. Right. Everything about it is uncomfortable. It, it, do you know that there are some Christians, I heard one this morning on the call with tears in her eyes and crack in her voice who's suffering and she said, oh, there's some time that you know that you want to give up because of suffering that you go through because you can't Somebody came right behind her sister it was and said, sometimes God chooses you to suffer because he knows that you'll tell all about how God brought you out. Sometimes God chooses you to suffer because he knows that he can get glory because you're not going to give up. You're not going to walk out. You're not going to turn around. You're not going to drop the cross halfway through it. You're going to stick in there, stay in there. You're going to give it all that you have and your testimony will be sure. So God picks those to go through something so that he can be glorified. The God, the Bible says it like this in 1 Peter 2, 21, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow his footsteps. You must follow his footsteps. I'll give you a closing right here. They found him. They forced him. They forgot him. But they made him famous. <laughs> they, they made him famous. Because had they not found him, had they not 
forced him. Well, Had they not forgotten him, yeah. we wouldn't know nothing about him. We know about him because it was a dark day. Well, we, we, we know about him because, because JT Woodhouse said it like this, that a sinner bear the cross for Christ and Christ bear the cross for sinners. We, 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 we know about Simon because when he was minding his own business, they laid it all on the cross on his shoulders.
for our sin. And as a man who served, I say he's infamous, I say he's famous. Who was found by the Roman soldiers. Who was forced to carry the cross of Jesus. Forgotten by the soldiers, but reminded to all of us again this morning. That because he carried the cross, the cross that weighed Jesus down, one theologian said that they wanted somebody else to carry the cross because they were afraid that if Jesus carried it all the way up down to this hill, that he might die in the process. And you know if he died in the process, that he wouldn't have been the Savior, right? Because he had to be nailed. The song said, hung on the tree. He had to be nailed. He had to be crucified in order to be the Messiah. I know that I took for granted last week. Let's just be real transparent. I felt very awkward. Offered invitations to discipleship at 8 a.m. last week. So I didn't do it at 11 a.m. And when that should have been what I was doing, a young man came down the aisle. On his Christian experience, he joined this body of believers. And he said to me after church, That sitting here today, I know that this is my church home. Well, and he said, I want to be a part of what y'all are doing here in Cartersville. So with that, I heard it. I learned it in seminary. And the flesh caused me not to do it at 11 a.m. last week. But this week, I want to be obedient to the Spirit. I want to be obedient to the teaching that I've been taught for many years, and that is whenever the gospel is preached, always, always extend the invitation to salvation. That I will praise him on the sounding brass and the tinkling symbol. I will praise him on the harp. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time. I thank you for these that have come to share with us in this place today. I thank you, Father God, that even during the time of shelter in place, that you are a shelter in a time of storm. That even in a time of shelter in place, you're bred in a starving land. That even in a time of shelter in place, you have not forgotten us. We thank you for these modes of media that we've used to share the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Lord, may we not recognize that you have blessed us to be able to do it this way, but that the doors of the church are open. That we can come and cry make our request known to you. You will hear and answer our prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together. This is our prayer. In Christ Jesus' name we pray.